Well, good morning, everyone. It is a beautiful morning. So today, this morning, we are going to return to the series that we exited um, for Advent, and we are going to return to, to the book of Acts. It's been about six weeks since we've been in Acts, and for some of you, that is just long enough that you have completely forgot everything that we've learned in the book of Acts. So to refresh your memory of where we're at, so at the end of chapter 15 in Acts, We saw the missionary team of Barnabas and Paul split up, and it split up over a difference um, regarding uh, Barnabas' cousin, Mark. And so what we saw at the end of chapter 15 in Acts was this one core missionary team of Paul and Barnabas uh, splitting into two missionary teams. We saw that Barnabas and Mark headed to the island of Cyprus while we saw that uh, Paul and Silas uh, took a land route and headed back into um, Turkey. Uh, And what we saw there was, while in Turkey, while in Lystra and Iconium, uh, Paul and Silas started adding to their missionary team. They picked up Timothy uh, while they were in Lystra and Iconium, and he went on to join this missionary team. And what we also saw as we started to open up chapter 16 is that the Holy Spirit was ultimately the one that was leading this missionary endeavor. And we saw saw this because something surprising happened in our text as chapter 16 unfolded. All of a sudden, this new wrinkle, this new complication was introduced into the ministry of Paul and Silas, and that was the fact that the Holy Spirit was preventing them from speaking the Word of God in this area of Turkey that they were traveling. And what we also saw was when they decided that they wanted to head northward to this area of uh, Bithia, that we see that the Spirit of Jesus prevented them from traveling to this area. So in one area, we have the Holy Spirit uh, preventing Paul from preaching the word, and in another regard, we have the Spirit of Jesus preventing them from traveling to this northern area of Turkey. And so as chapter 16 continues to unfold, uh, Paul and company start to head to the only place that is open to them, this port city of Troas. And we don't know how long Paul was in Troas. We don't know if they were there for a single evening or if they were there for a few days waiting for their next assignment from God. But it's while they are in Troas that they added another member to their missionary team because it's where Luke, the the person who has a gospel attributed to them and also the author of the book that we're in, the book of Acts, it's where Luke joins this missionary team team. And it's while Paul and the team are in this port city of Troas that Paul receives this vision. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then after this, Luke tells us, he records that immediately Paul sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called them to preach the gospel to them. And so with that, Paul is about to leave Turkey, and he's about to move to a new region, a new area that the gospel had not been preached yet. He is going to be moving towards Europe. And that's going to bring us to our text this morning, which is Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 15. Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. When you find your place, please stand to honor the reading of God's word.
So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lord, I pray that you would direct our steps, that you would open our hearts to receive and understand your word, that your word may instruct us, correct us, encourage us, guide us, that your spirit would help us to be obedient to what your word has called us to be. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would open up opportunities for us to share the gospel, that you would open hearts and minds and and provide these opportunities. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you would be praised and glorified in our time of worship and our time together. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So, as I reviewed just a moment ago, Paul receives this vision from God to go to this area in Macedonia, to leave Turkey and go to this new land. And we see in our text that that is exactly what this missionary team, Paul and company, do. And so they leave Troas and they travel across the Aegean Sea to head to this new land. And one of the things that I appreciate about Luke and a detail that I think we should take note of in the text is just as uh, Luke records the the details of Paul's missionary journey uh, across the land when when Paul and Barnabas split up, and we see that, that Paul heads across the desert, that Luke records for us the various cities to kind of give us this, this breadcrumb, this route that Paul and the missionary team are coming across. It gives us that validity, the extra accuracy of, of understanding the direction and, and where this missionary team is going. And here in chapter 16, we see Luke do exactly the, the same thing. He gives us details about their sea route. He tells us that they left the port of Troas and they went to this small island, which is Samothrace, and then from Samothrace to Neapolis, and from Neapolis to Philippi. And then Luke tells us that Philippi was a leading city in Macedonia and also telling us that it's a Roman colony. And again, these details end up becoming important because as we continue to push deeper into Acts 16, we will note that that Paul and Silas and Paul and this missionary team start to run up against the culture and run up against the, the government that's in place in Philippi and in this place in Macedonia. And so we ought to also appreciate the details. One day, one day, this will work. Oh, now I've clicked too far. Okay, there we go. So we should appreciate what we have here in verse chapter, I'm sorry, verse 12, that they remained in the city some days. And the reason why this is an important point that we see repeated, a theme that's constantly brought back up throughout the scriptures, is because we are reminded that that these servants of God are on God's timetable. That there's this level of expectation that to be a servant of God, to do what God has called someone to do, requires waiting on God. It requires patience. Because even though we see that Luke has, I'm sorry, that Paul has this clear vision of, of where he believes he's, go, he's supposed to go next, and he knows that this is a direction given to him from God, we still see that he comes to this place and there's still this expectation that while he's there, while he's being obedient to God, 
that he needs to wait for God to give him that next step. He is where God wants him to be. And now he's focused on what God wants him to do, and that is to share the good news of Jesus with those that that God puts in his path. I imagine from the moment that Paul arrived in Philippi, his heart was focused on this endeavor of sharing the gospel. The, the, The clear call that God had put on Paul's life. I imagine when he arrived in Philippi, the very first thing he started to do was seek out, are are there other Jews in this community? Is there a, a Jewish synagogue here? And then his next question, if there isn't a Jewish synagogue, is, well, where do the people assemble in this town? Where is it that we can go to preach this word that God has given us that's going to have the greatest impact? Next week, as we continue through this text, we, we have this, this, this telescoping into the text where we get this, uh, uh, these details about what Paul was doing while he was waiting for his next direction from God. But while he is here in Philippi, he knew that he was where God wanted him to be. And so he needed to focus on what God had called him to do. And one of the things that that I am reminded of and something that I I hope to encourage you with is this recognition that when God opens a door for us, that we shouldn't walk through that door wondering to ourselves, oh, okay, I've, I've been obedient, God. I've walked through this door. Now what? Instead, we should walk through these opportunities or these opportunities that God presents us with the confidence of knowing that God has made a way, that God opened this door, that God has directed our path to go to a certain place. And then ask ourselves the question, Not, what does God want me to do next? But to recognize that Scripture has called us to a purpose. That God called us to be a good news sharing people. To share the joy and excitement regarding Jesus Christ with those that are around us. And so we should have that confidence of knowing that when God presents us new opportunities, that the question isn't, okay, now what, God? But rather the question we need to ask ourselves is to have our eyes open and to look around to see the opportunities of sharing the gospel message with those people around us. For us to be a praying people that God would open our eyes to these gospel sharing opportunities. In verse 13, it describes that Paul and company were searching, that they weren't simply hanging out by a drinking fountain or hanging back in in that time's coffee shop waiting and wondering, but Paul knew his purpose. Share the gospel, create disciples, confront false teaching as it crossed his path. And then we see here on the Sabbath day, They traveled outside of the city of Philippi. They were looking for people to evangelize. And they heard that there was this area outside of the city gate that was near the river where people congregated to pray. And so just as Paul has done in the past, whether he is seeking out uh, synagogues to share the gospel in or in crowded town squares, this is the place that Paul is going to travel to be able to share the good news of Jesus. So they head down by the river, and when they saw a group of people, they sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. I think it's important for us to see in the text that that Paul initially sits down with a group, plural. There's multiple people there that Paul is sharing the gospel message with. And yet Luke records this detail that there there was one woman, one woman, out of this group in particular, that that heard this message that Paul was sharing. And her name is Lydia. And Luke tells us a little bit about this woman, Lydia. Luke tells us that she is from Thyatira. And Thyatira is this city that actually is in uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey is what actually the scriptures refer to as the region of, of Asia. 
And one of the reasons why I, I think that this is an important point for us to consider is because as chapter 16 in Acts opens up, uh, it is a little uh, difficult to understand. Why is it that God prevented Paul and company from speaking the word of God in this area of Turkey, in this area known as Asia, this area of Thyatira? And it's, it's fascinating to realize that it's not as if God had forsaken this land, these people in, in the middle of Turkey. It's amazing to realize that God works in amazing ways. That it's not God had forsaken the people in, in Thyatira. It's not that God wasn't going to share the message with these people, but instead to recognize that God's ways still get the, the goal accomplished. That God, that, that God can send people to another land, in this case, Macedonia, Philippi. And in this city are people that actually live in this area that Paul was prevented from, from preaching the word. And so here, Paul is talking to this woman, Lydia. Lydia is paying attention. She hears what Paul is saying. And so there's this recognition that the gospel message is is still going to places that at first seemed like they were closed off. The Bible describes Lydia as a seller of purple goods and as a worshiper of, of God. The text telling us that she is from Thyatira and that she is a worshiper of God tells us that she is a Gentile. She is not Jewish. This this label, worshiper of God. Uh, in other places in Acts, uh, we see them referred to as God-fearers. Uh, people who were Gentiles, but acknowledged that the God of Judaism, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was the true one and living God. And so Lydia, even though she is a Gentile, recognizes that there is one true God. And ultimately, by 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 staying in fellowship with, with fellow God-fearers or worshipers of God, there's this recognition that this woman who grew up in a pagan culture with many false gods and, and religion where you have to try to work your way of trying to have some sort of works-based righteousness with God, there's this recognition that Lydia had turned her back to all of this, to the religiosity of, of paganism, turned her back to the false gods of her culture and was trying to find a way to have a relationship with God. And then this other point that, that she is described as a seller of purple goods. Uh, purple goods at this time were extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, the, the, only the super elite, the, the wealthy and the powerful, could afford these these purple robes. Uh, one of the primary ways, that, and the most expensive way, that they were able to get this purple dye was from harvesting sea snails. And this purple dye came from this sea snail, and as you might imagine, it would require a lot of sea snails to be able to get a nice, deep purple color on a large robe. And so typically what you have is, is only the, 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 the super... Uh, Powerful, like the governors of, 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 of Roman districts would have these purple robes, or, or royalty, members of royal families would have these purple garments. And lastly, after Lydia comes to faith, she implores Paul and company to stay at her house, and this tells us that she owned a house. And secondly, that she owned a house that was large enough to comfortably house Paul and his missionary team. Bottom line, when we look at Lydia, what we see is a woman who is independent. She's an influential businesswoman, and she is quite wealthy. You know, I'm preparing for this sermon see a lot of people focusing a great deal on this person, Lydia. And, and the reason why that's a bit problematic is because uh, there's only four verses in the Bible that tell us much about 
this woman of God named Lydia. Uh, who Lydia is, uh, who she is, in her, her station in life, her personality, what leadership she may have had in the church later on, all of these things are, are really not the point of, of Lydia being recorded in Scripture. Instead, Lydia marks an important moment in the spread of the gospel message. You've heard me say this before, that that while having a relationship with God, being in the presence of God, uh, having eternal life with God, uh, that point, that to, to, to recognize that, to realize that, puts you in an exclusive association with God. To have uh, that communion with God is exclusive because it requires a perfect holiness, a perfect righteousness that not one person on this earth has on their own. And so while having that relationship with God is quite exclusive, how we get there is quite inclusive. That is, that it's given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we recognize that Jesus makes this this call out for repentance and faith to all people, and to all people who embrace this gift that Jesus has paid for with his blood, allows them to have his righteousness. And so while we have gone through Acts, we see the road through Acts demonstrates this point clearly, that, that Jesus makes a way for all types of people. If you were just to, to take a, a quick survey through just what we have covered in Acts, one of the things you'll see is that in Acts chapter 2, that, that moment of, of Pentecost, we see that the, the gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, goes out to that original Jewish audience. And then as Acts continues to unfold, the next people that receive the gospel message, the very next people are people who the Jews found offensive or people who could not have true fellowship true communion in a, in a Jewish context. The first group we see come to faith in Jesus Christ are, is a Samaritan. The next, a eunuch, an Ethiopian eunuch. In chapter 9 of Acts, the great persecutor of the church, Saul comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And then we see a Gentile man, a Roman soldier, embrace the gospel message. And then here in Acts chapter 16, Luke records that a Gentile woman comes to faith in Jesus Christ. I think I've Goodness. All right. Sorry. Let's go back. Is this doing anything or are you doing it? Thank you. All right. I'm going to have to fix that next week. It's driving me crazy. So Luke, carried by the Holy Spirit, records these details, making it abundantly clear that whoever hears the gospel message and and grabs on to the reality of of making the gospel message their own can embrace the good news as being their own. And so throughout Acts, we see the gospel message being going out to, to Jew and Gentile, man and woman, doesn't matter their ethnicity, whether they're Middle Eastern or they're black or they are European, Roman, Greek, or barbarian, rich or poor, ruler or ruled. There's a recognition that if God opens your eyes, ears, and heart to the gospel message, if, if you recognize the beauty of this amazing gift of the gospel, it's your opportunity to grab onto it, just as we see Lydia grabbing onto it in our text. 
recognize that the good news of Jesus is not limited to social convention or social norms, but rather the good news is for sinners, for people who recognize that they are alienated from a holy God, who desire forgiveness, reconciliation, and adoption by this amazing and holy God. And then Luke writes in the second half of verse 14, that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. It is so important for us to recognize that there is no part, no part of, of ministry or sharing the gospel that, that isn't uh, guided by the Spirit of God. That, that this entire spiritual endeavor doesn't rest on our shoulders, but rather it, it rests on God. You know, yes, we are given a, a, a command and a tremendous privilege to serve God, but we must always remember, and text is clear, that it is God who goes before us. It is God that dwells in us. And it's God who ultimately supports us that allows these endeavors to see any level of fruit or success. I remember Paul writing in Ephesians, he writes it, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And then as he goes on in this text, right, this is, he opens this up, and then it opens up to this passage that we uh, typically refer to as the armor of God. And it's like Paul is looking at a Roman soldier. As he's looking at this Roman soldier, you can almost see him depicting like what these pieces of armament on this guard would look like and what it represents from a, a spiritual standpoint. And as he's finished listening off the, the armaments of, of perhaps what a Roman soldier would be wearing, he concludes by saying, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. I, I bring this up. I bring us to this point of, of recognizing the spiritual armor and recognizing the significance, the importance, the centrality of coming to God when we, we're talking about ministry endeavors and we're talking about gospel opportunities. For us to recognize that, that God has to be at the forefront of this endeavor. And then we see in our text the Holy Spirit opening Lydia's heart to pay attention. It's again this, this clear reminder that God is the one who works in salvation. You know, whether we recognize it as prevenient grace or effectual grace, we must recognize that it is by God's grace that the gospel message is able to penetrate hearts, able to, to change hearts, able to change one's thinking. It's the Spirit of God that convicts people of sin to make them recognize their mortality, their limitations in comparison to a grand and holy God. Historic Christianity has always, always affirmed the necessity of God to convict and draw sinners towards him. This means, just like Paul, we too must rely on the Holy Spirit to open ears, open eyes, soften hearts. We have a role, just as Paul presented in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And yet too often in evangelism and in ministry, we, we see two extremes. One extreme is this idea that, well, God is going to do the work, and so we don't have to do anything. 
And the other extreme is this idea that, well, in order to share the gospel, in order to build up Christ's church, that therefore it rests upon our shoulders and we have to do all of the work. Both of these extremes are dangerous places to be. Instead, I encourage us to be a, a praying people, to seek the will, the guidance, and blessing of God. That God would give us a heart to, to love those around us, to give us the courage and the, and the boldness to speak the words that God has recorded in his word. To share those words with the people around us. That God would give us a heart of obedience. And then right along with that, that God would, that just as we see in our text in Acts, right? You know, Paul sits down with this group of women, and as he's preaching to them, there's this recognition that there is one person in this group that, that's receiving this word, that, that the Holy Spirit has, has caused Lydia to open her heart and to pay attention. And so part of our prayer, before we go out and share the gospel with other people, before we embrace these ministry opportunities, is to recognize that, that we should have eyes. We should pray that God would give us eyes to see the people that are perhaps receptive to his word, that want to hear and, and receive the gospel message. Something that, that we need to seek God for. And then verse 15 begins that after she was baptized, this recognizes that, that Lydia had come to faith in Jesus Christ. I like to remind people that baptism is not necessary for salvation. I know that's a dangerous thing for a Baptist to say out loud. But baptism is not necessary for salvation. And we see this from Scripture, right? You remember the, the two thieves uh, on the crosses that, that were adjacent to Jesus. Um, after these two thieves had gone through their period of mocking Jesus, of, of doubting who Jesus is, we have this point in their, in their experience, in, in their time with Jesus while they're on the cross, that one of them, one of them slowly recognizes who this person is that's next to them. That this there is something special about this one. That, that this person that's on the cross is with them. Uh, there's one among them that's actually innocent. That, that doesn't deserve to be there. And with that, he, he asks Jesus that, 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 that he would remember him in his kingdom. This clear recognition of who Jesus is. Lord, recognize me. Remember me in your kingdom. And you remember what Jesus responded back. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. This, this promise that Jesus makes to, i got to say it's a little quieter, an unbaptized man. This recognition that this person was saved, had a relationship with Jesus Christ, was going to be in Christ's kingdom, despite the fact that, that this person was not baptized Yet baptism, which is a transliteration of the Greek word baptismo, means to immerse or submerge. Believers are baptized because Jesus commands it. And, and as we have gone through Acts, we see that it is a, a frequent act that believers do in response to their new faith. I've often heard it expressed this way, that baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality, a confession that, that we too have died to our sins, that, that we are, are buried with Christ when one is under the water. And when we come out of the water, there's this recognition that it's this, this symbol, this representation of a new life risen with Jesus Christ. And yet, what we are seeing in Acts is not simply a one way confession or a one way expression like I mentioned earlier what we are seeing in Acts are people from all walks of life coming to faith in Jesus all of these different types of people 
all of these different backgrounds, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, accepting this gift of the gospel, and this, this recognition of being baptized isn't just their confession of faith. But we need to recognize that when somebody is baptized, it's two people that are part of this process. There's the person who's being baptized, and then there's the person who's baptizing them. There's this recognition that the one who's baptizing them is, is also a fellow believer in Jesus Christ, part of that body of Christ. And so while this believer is professing their faith in Jesus Christ, the one baptizing them is confirming that faith, that they are part of this family of God, that they are my brother or my sister, that they're your brother and sister. It's this, it's this beautiful moment where both the, the confessor and us as witnesses to that confession recognize the unity that the family that we have in Jesus Christ. This recognition that, that we are all adopted sons and daughters of God Most High. And in our text, Lydia invites, urges Paul and company to stay with her at her home, saying that if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord... Come to my house and stay. And then Luke concludes it, that she prevailed upon us, meaning that she convinced them. She, she had a strong argument, very persuasive. And we see that Paul judged that she had been faithful. Lydia was not a, a Gentile alienated from God, seeking self-righteousness through works of the law. Pa Paul affirms, recognizes Lydia, this, this Gentile, former Gentile pagan, recognizes that she had been forgiven, a redeemed sister in Christ, a fellow heir of the kingdom, and a fellow co-laborer. You know, I, I, I stand up here week after week, and at times when I, when I talk about the gospel message, I, I try to labor this point when we see people come to the gospel, that what we do not see are, are people who hear the good news of Jesus Christ and then are given some sort of, of waiting period of, okay, now get your life right first, prove yourself worthy to come to Jesus, and then after you've done that, let's, let's go to the second step of, of talking about what Jesus has done for us. Instead, what we recognize when we see the gospel message shared throughout the, the, the book of Acts, time and again, what we see are people whose lives are not right. That God meets them right where they're at. There was no sacrifice necessary apart from the finished work of Jesus. There was no added works of the law, no financial cost of admission, no waiting period, no theological entrance exam. She accepted the gift of Jesus. And in her joy of receiving this gift, she professed it publicly. And if I had to guess, she, she professed it right there where she heard the gospel message. You remember, this story starts with Paul coming to the side of a river to talk to this group of women. And I imagine that after Lydia comes to faith in Jesus Christ and her excitement in recognizing who she is now, what she's being forgiven from, who she now has a relationship with, there's this recognition that she probably got baptized right there in the river that they were standing right next to. Friends, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and as I spoke this morning, the, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has been working on your heart to receive the words that I have been sharing this morning about Lydia and this, and this experience that we see recorded in the text. If you do not know Jesus and this message has, has resonated with you in some way, talk with me after this service. If you do know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you have not expressed that faith through baptism, I invite you 
speak with me about getting baptized. If you're somebody who wants 90 degree water, you can do it right here. I'm a fan of 90 degree water. But if you want to see a pastor squirm a little bit, we can do it in the lake. Not now. I have my limits. But this summer, I'm hoping that we can do a, a church barbecue down by the lake, and it would be amazing. If somebody here wants to get baptized for you to, and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, to come speak with me so that we can make this happen. Because it's not just something that, that you celebrate as your profession of faith. As I've said it every time we've baptized somebody here this, this past year, it's our time to celebrate. It's our time to recognize that, that, that the body of Christ just got a little sweeter, a little bigger. And that's such a, a beautiful point for us to consider. Friends, when we look at what we see in, in, in Acts, when we look at Lydia, we consider the fact that who is accepting the gospel message? Who is hearing the gospel message? It is such an amazing gift for us to recognize. Such an amazing moment to see this, this beautiful gift being extended to so many people and to see people accepting this gift that Jesus paid for through his blood. It is a beautiful thing when you begin to realize, not just from an academic or, or a, a mental standpoint of, yes, I recognize what the gospel is, and yes, it's a beautiful thing. Not for us to just go through the motions of answering the questions, but for us to recognize in our hearts to have this personal relationship through, with Jesus Christ. To recognize what we've been forgiven from. To recognize that the way Scripture describes believers in Christ as being new, new creatures. Our old self is gone. It's dead. It's behind us. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer children of this world, children of the devil, but rather we are adopted children of God Most High. When you begin to realize what it is that Jesus did for us, how can we not celebrate and have this joy in our hearts that we see in Scripture? How can we not want to get baptized over and over? I'm not saying we do that. To get baptized over and over again, to want to show and profess our faith, to say that, yes, I am a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. How can we not? How do we keep that excitement inside of us? Because in, in the Bible, while we read it, I think if we were there, it would be a moment of tremendous joy and such excitement to see people who were cut off from God, who didn't have that relationship, all of a sudden have that relationship, all of a sudden realize what the truth is. And for us to have these story after story, event after event in the in scriptures of, of different people from different walks of life, different uh, positions in life, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that should give us all hope. That should give us all hope in this room. That gives us hope when we think of our family members, our, our employers, our whatever the relationships are that we're thinking out outside of these walls who may not know Jesus. It gives us hope knowing that the gospel message is for all of these types of people. When I close this out here in prayer in a moment, the one thing I, I want you to have in your heart, if, if there was anything that I could stress upon you this morning, it's that as we sing this last song, that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let that joy, that happiness bubble outside of you. Sing praises to God for what He has saved us from. Sing praises to God that we can have a relationship with Him, that He loves us, that He guides us, that He comforts us, and He cares for us. All of these promises in God that we see God making to those whom He calls His children are offered to us. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day that You have given us. We thank you for all of these examples of all of these various types of people that you have saved in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would give us that joy in our heart of knowing who we are in you. The people that, that don't have a relationship with you would see that joy in our face, see that, 
that little bounce in our step. Regardless of what we may be going through individually, what we may be going through in our life, knowing that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that regardless of our circumstance, regardless of the challenge that we face, that you are there 